Holic Honda S2000, driving the classics. Some call it character, others charm. Those little imperfections that give a machine a soul. Like all greats the Honda S2000 isn't perfect. In fact, it's not overstating things to say that the early cars were pretty hairy. They felt edgy with a chassis that darted the car across the road to every twitch of the driver's shoulders. Match that to power delivery more akin to a motorbike than a car and, it was a recipe for ditch finding, especially in damp conditions. If you knew what you were doing, then the S2000 was hugely rewarding but it was always a hard car to master, it would often teach an unwelcome lesson the first time you approached the red line with anything other than dead ahead dialed into the steering. But is a spiky performance and nervous chassis really how we should label the S2000? We flew out to Spain to test the last limited edition 100 car built in 2009 and featuring revised suspension, to see if the S2000 recipe finally came good. Back in 1999, if you wanted a back-to-basics roadster that was quick, handsome and had a stiff chassis with 50-50 weight distribution, you didn't have too many options. The MX-5 wasn't far off, but you could hardly call that quick, and the MGF was little better. Before the S2000, roadsters generally came with scuttle shake, that awful vibration of the windscreen and dash when you hit a bump, and Honda's motorsport engineers, who were tasked with making the S2000, were determined to eliminate this. Their solution? The high exponent frame. This steel monocoque chassis and body structure gave the S2000 levels of rigidity previously unheard of in open top cars. The S2000's engine also set the Honda apart from the rest. It produces 237 bhp from a 2.0 liter block, impressive enough today, let alone back in 2009, and it did so without forced induction, too. What's more, the S2000 also revs to 9000 revolutions per minute and that 4 pot is placed so far back in the engine bay, it technically made the Honda a front, mid-engine sports car. The sweet spot is unquestionably in the 7000-8500 range, and the gorgeous 6-speed box makes keeping the engine revved up an easy task, snicking around the gate with an easy, metallic charm. Basically. There hadn't been a roadster with this level of focus on the driver since the Lotus Elise. The seating position is the first clue that this car takes its sporting credentials rather seriously. You're sat on the floor with your legs stretched out in front, like a 1950s Le Mans racer. The first thing you notice staring you in the face is the huge digital rev counter. This is the next clue to the nature of this machine, all other dials are secondary. The alloy knob is perfectly placed under your left palm on top of the high central transmission tunnel, which juts into the cabin and limits space for larger drivers. It's so intrusive because it sprouts from the gearbox directly under the lever, it's why the shift feels so direct. There's a lot of black plastic but the overall feeling inside the cabin is one of quality without superfluous addenda. The red seats and carpet which had become something of a fast Honda trademark by the late 1990s, heighten the sense of occasion.